Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me this morning. Come grab a cup of coffee. Let's look in the book of Colossians for hope for today. God bless you. Grab a cup of coffee, mm. fruit, juice, a smoothie, whatever you start the day with. And let's look at the Word of God. In Colossians yesterday, we were looking at the centrality of Christ. And after we share a couple of prayer requests, we're going to look at what he is besides the creator. We saw him as yesterday. When we get there, of course, pray for the folks around you, of course, that might have COVID-19. I've got one for you again today. Elaine Helms, we're praying for you today and your granddaughter, Christine, who has COVID-19 and is in the hospital now, why it is that sometimes cases of COVID-19 uh, apparently are mild with some people, with many people, uh, something like 99.5% of all people that get it are going to survive it, but with some, it just knocks you for a loop. And uh, in this particular case, Christine will be praying for you because it's landed you in the hospital. So all our prayer is going out to you today. And also pray for James Wigington affectionately known around here as Wild Man, ended up in the emergency room last night and has a real bad case of gastritis. So uh, y'all pray for James today, that God would heal him, the medicine would work, and he would get better because God's really using him in our church at this particular time. And thank you, Pastor Wes, for uh, taking him to the emergency room and hanging out and making sure he was taken care of and helping him get his medicine today. We really appreciate your ministry with us, dear brother. And then a different kind of prayer request. This is for the world, okay? You may or may not have already heard in the news what took place in Nigeria. Boko Haram came into a village firing their Kalashnikovs into the air and began to take over, kidnapping some 300 plus boys from a local boarding school. It may be the largest single mass kidnapping in history. They took them off into the woods. One or two did escape and came back to tell the story of what was going on with these kids as they were being marched through the jungle with no food and little water to who knows what and who knows where. Because Boko Haram is a group of Islamic jihadis that continue to terrorize Africa, uh, we know and understand without them even saying so what their purpose was, but they were glad, glad to tell us. They came back and claimed responsibility for the kidnapping and said they did it because of Islam. That's their claim, not mine. They said we did it for Islam because Western education is very bad and it is against Allah and we wanted to stop this. We will educate these boys in what they're supposed to know, which means basically they're going to turn them into suicide bombers and jihadis if they have their way as they kidnap them and take them off into the jungle, or they'll present them, as has been suggested, for some ransom so that they can buy more bullets for their Kalashnikovs and buy more weapons of war to continue their jihadist experience all over Africa. They've terrorized northern uh, Nigeria for some time, so please pray for the folks. It was at one time limited to northeastern Nigeria. This school is in the northwest. And to see, did they get what they wanted? Well, the only reaction from other folks, including the Nigerian government, the United Nations, and everybody else has been verbal condemnations. It says, uh, this is bad. Please return these boys immediately. You remember when something similar took place back in 2014 when they kidnapped over 200 girls? And uh, all we got out of it from the United States was a hashtag that uh, Michelle Obama pushed out there, bring back our girls. Well, guess what? We've got a new hashtag, hashtag today, bring back our boys. But there are no groups of armed forces mobilizing to head off into the woods to fight this army of terrorists that's been allowed to roam free in the jungle and to sponsor terrorism all over Africa. So folks, pray. Pray for our brethren in Africa, especially Christians who in Nigeria in particular have been massacred in the last decade at an alarming rate. Many just killed because of one thing, because they worship the guy we're about to talk about. They worship Jesus Christ. Did uh, Boko Haram get what they wanted? Yeah, all the northern Nigerian schools are closed today. Of course, I, I would close them too. 
but that was their objective, wasn't it? Stop education. Education is bad. In classrooms, these young men would be understanding why what Boko Haram is doing is wrong. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Colossians chapter number one. Let's get into the word this morning and look at this Savior we celebrate at Christmas. Yesterday, we saw him being central to the gospel message. He's not just, a, it's not just something that's kind of about him on the side. He is the center of it all. So this Christmas celebration is, first of all, about our creator. We left off in uh, verse uh, 16, 17, where it says everything was created by him. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. That there are invisible things. It's quite an interesting revelation to the folks in the first century. But yes, the invisible, down to the minutest piece of a molecule and subatomic particles, the creator is the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and by him all things hold together. But today we get some new revelations into who this child in the manger actually is. It says he is also the head of the body, the church. You, know, you ask people who's the head of the church, they probably agree with this passage of scripture. Say, oh, it's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Let me ask you a second question. Who's the head of your church? You know, unfortunately, some churches have devolved this Despite the name that might be on the outside, on the door, the, the church has devolved into something that's headed by human beings who often don't seem to have Christ in mind in what they are doing. Uh, Louis Farrakhan is back in the news, and I won't mention any more about him today, uh, head of the Nation of Islam, who uh, you know, promotes his lunacy over and over. For some reason, people seem to keep inviting him to events to speak so he can spew out his idiotic ideas. And when I saw that uh, some years ago in Washington, D.C., a, quote, Baptist church actually asked him to come speak at a conference, I said, Is, could that possibly be a church that would invite an apostate like Louis Farrakhan to come and speak? I doubt it. So, folks, when you see the word church on a sign, it may or may not mean it has anything to do with Jesus, even if they've stuck Jesus' name on the board. Listen, friends, Jesus has to be head of the church, not just the church in general, in the nice, big, uh, fluffy term to re reply to the universal church, but he's got to be head of your church. And if you're in a church where Christ is not the head, you need to find another church. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, many churches just become the little power structures for a group of people who want to control something. And they can't get maybe elected or, uh, or employed in a place where they control a lot of people, so they find a church that will let them do it. Friends, listen, one of the worst things that can ever happen is for some, even a dictatorial pastor who doesn't know Jesus or a group of organized board members or a patriarch or a matriarch or someone else decide they are going to try to control Christ's church and be the head. Friends, whenever we're doing anything, as far as the church is concerned, we need to be asking, what would Jesus do? Go back to that WWJD thing. Because he, and only he, should be the head of the church. Remember when we were in the book of Revelation, we read about a church at Laodicea already that had pushed Jesus out the side door. That picture of Jesus standing at the door and knocking is him standing at the door of the church, a church that was going about their merry business, thought they were rich and in need of nothing when Jesus was standing on the outside saying, let me back in. Friends, it is Jesus that is head of the church. It also says that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might come to have first place in everything. First place in everything? That's right. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself. So Jesus is the ultimate, my friends. Yes, we celebrate his birth. And here he is, this little helpless, seemingly helpless baby in a manger. That helpless baby is much more than that. 
He not only would grow up and present his perfect life as a sacrifice for our sins, but he did it ultimately to reconcile the world to himself, and he will ultimately be in control of this world when we have just about broken it down to its biggest disaster, and then he returns to straighten it all out. Because the Bible says in the previous book of the Bible, in Philippians chapter 2, that God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So friends, ultimately, it is Jesus who is not only creator, but ultimate Lord over all. And where does Christmas come back in? Listen to the last part of this in verse number 20. Of course, it said he did this through him to reconcile everything to himself with the things on heaven, uh, on earth, or things in heaven. By doing what? Making peace. It is the Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who has made peace for you and I. Making peace, how? Through his blood shed on the cross. Folks, the Prince of Peace purchased our peace with a terrible price, his own precious blood. That's how you and I have redemption, reconciliation with God through him, not some kind of cheap grace. It's just, oh, it's okay. Do what you want to. Just ask God's forgiveness. No, my friends, understand it is because of our sin and rebellion and rejection that Jesus died. But he shed his precious blood so that this peace we talk about at Christmas can first and foremost reign in your heart and then ultimately one day will reign in all the earth. And that's my prayer for those poor folks in Africa having to deal with Boko Haram today and every place on this globe. The answer is now as it has always been, the Lord Jesus, the same one we celebrate at Christmas and in hopes that one day soon his peace will reign. God bless you. I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in the Word.